Hello everybody and welcome to this A-Level Chemistry video. This is a video that I've made in response to a number of questions that I've been asked in the comments where people are asking me to explain how the required practical number two links to thermodynamics. So in other words, how can calorimetry, which is typically year one chemistry, link to thermodynamics, which is usually taught as year two. And this is a really important question, not just for the present moment, but it will be important moving forward for everybody because it's really common for A-level questions at the end of the two-year course to not just be on second year content, but to tie in with year one and year two all in one go. So that's what I'm gonna unpick in this video. How does this look when the year one and year two chemistry content is tied together? Alongside this, I will be linking a number of videos in my description for this video, such as exam question walkthroughs about the required practical itself, another one about Bourne Harbour cycles, and another walkthrough about entropy change questions. And I will also link in some of my energetics explained videos from year one chemistry. Feel free to check out any of those you fancy to support the content in this video. Before we take a look at thermodynamics, let's first remind ourselves about calorimetry and what that required practical actually involves. Well, there are actually three different scenarios that you could be faced with to do with calorimetry. Number one is when you take a known mass of a solid and you put it into a solution or into a liquid. So this might be magnesium powder being put into copper sulfate. It might be copper sulfate solid being dissolved in water. There are a few different options, but ultimately when you do this, you're working out your moles of perhaps both of your different reagents, using the limiting reagent as your moles that is going to influence the enthalpy change. Then you're going to use Q equals MC delta T, and the M is going to be the mass of the solution, because remember, 50 cm cubed of solution will have a mass of 50 grams. Once you've got your Q, you can do delta H is equal to negative Q divided by N. And remember that Q needs to be in kilojoules because delta H is kilojoules per mole. The second option is if you take one solution and you pour it into another solution, thereby mixing those two volumes of solution and they will react together. Well, in this scenario, you're going to have to work out the moles of both of your two solutions Again, use the limiting moles as your determinant as to the enthalpy change. The M in Q equals MC delta T is going to be the total combined volume of these two solutions. And so if this one is 40 and this one is 30, the total volume will be 70 and the mass will be 70 grams. And so again, that will be for Q. And then delta H equals minus Q over N in the normal way. And then last of all, you might have a particular fuel such as ethanol or any alcohol really, and you're burning it down here and the heat energy gets caught by a copper can with a known volume of water at the top. And this water gets heated up and that will be the delta T will be of this water. So the M is going to be the volume of this solution turned into grams and your Q will therefore be Q equals MC delta T with this being the source of the N. The N, the moles, that will be the moles of the fuel that you burn. And so you'll find the difference in mass in this spirit burner between the start and the end, and then divide that by the MR to get the moles. And delta H negative Q over N as standard. And then often the calorimetry experiment required practical follows on with some Hess's law calculation. And Hess's law, to remind you, is where the enthalpy change is independent of the route taken. So, for instance, if we've got a certain reactant turning into product, that will have an enthalpy change delta HR for delta H of the reaction. And so Hess's law says that we can go straight there, or we can go down this arrow to the intermediate, and then up this arrow the wrong way around, making that a negative symbol for the delta H2. And so delta HR is equal to delta H1 minus delta H2 in this situation. Now it's probably worth speculating what type of experiment comes up typically in a calorimetry question. Well, the absolutely most common one is this one that we can't measure directly. And they like that in a question where you might have this anhydrous copper sulfate 
and you turn it into this hydrated copper sulfate with five waters of crystallization attached to the lattice. And there's a color change attached to this. This is white, whereas this is blue. And what they would typically get you to do is to dissolve the copper sulfate and make copper sulfate solution. And while you do that, you'd measure the enthalpy change that occurs when you dissolve a known mass of solid in a known volume of solution, as we discussed earlier. And then you do it again with the hydrated copper sulfate. Again, known mass with this formula and turn it into the solution. And you'd work out the moles of this using the MR of the whole thing, by the way, not just the copper sulfate, it's the whole thing, the five waters as well. And you'd work out the enthalpy change for this change too. And then as before, the enthalpy change for this reaction is equal to delta H1 minus delta H2. And so they could get you to describe how you would do this experiment. And I've made a question walkthrough video that does just that, testing those skills about the practical technique. I'll put the link in the description to this video. Or they could get you to analyze data and actually calculate one of these enthalpy changes. And they'd probably give you the other and get you to work out the enthalpy change for this reaction that can't be measured directly. And that's because you can't be sure that you're adding precisely five water molecules rather than four or maybe six. Now I'm going to move on to tell you how I think this required practical could tie into thermodynamics. Well, there are three real parts to thermodynamics. There is the enthalpy of solution, there is the lattice enthalpy and big born harbor cycles, and there is entropy. And I'll now take a brief look at each of these in turn. I'm going to start with enthalpy of solution because I think this is the most likely tie-in with required practical to calorimetry. So in the enthalpy of solution, you start with an ionic compound and it dissolves. That is the enthalpy of solution. And after you've dissolved your ionic compound, one mole of it, you end up with aqueous ions, such as magnesium chloride dissolving and producing magnesium 2 plus and 2 Cl minus aqueous. And so in terms of calorimetry, why not dissolve a known mass of magnesium chloride and work out the enthalpy change for that? And then what they might get you to do is to either use your enthalpy of solution that you've calculated and some enthalpy of hydration data to work out the lattice dissociation enthalpy. So you use this very much like a Hess cycle, where if we start here and move up to the top, that is equal to the enthalpy of lattice dissociation. But we could follow that alternative route, moving down this arrow, so in the same direction as this arrow, and then moving the wrong way up this arrow, and we finish in the same position, these gaseous ions. So the lattice dissociation enthalpy in this instance is enthalpy of solution minus the sum of all those hydration enthalpies. That's one thing they could get you to do with your calculated enthalpy of solution value for, say, magnesium chloride. The other thing that they could get you to do is to use some data that they provide you entirely, so lattice dissociation enthalpy and a series of hydration enthalpies, to calculate a theoretical enthalpy of solution without actually doing the experiment. And that would allow for questions such as, explain why your value is different to the one that calculated using this born harbor cycle, and potentially you might include things like heat loss to the surroundings, or maybe it didn't dissolve properly when you were doing the actual enthalpy of solution experiment itself but both of those good tie-ins with the required practical. And then born harbor cycles on a larger scale, so that's where we've got enthalpy of atomization, ionization energy, more atomization, electron affinity and lattice formation, and enthalpy of formation of a particular substance. And I have made an exam question walkthrough video about born harbor cycles as well. Check that out if you fancy a refresh on that. So that doesn't tie in with enthalpy of solution, but there is a crossover with the enthalpy of lattice dissociation, with enthalpy of formation, and therefore with the whole cycle itself. So maybe using calorimetry data to work out one of these values, such as the enthalpy of formation maybe, and following up with a born harbor cycle question, possibly or maybe following up with some of the implications of born harbor cycles, such as how strong is that lattice? In other words, how exothermic is this enthalpy of lattice formation? 
And so crossing over with the hydration enthalpies that we've discussed before about how strongly the water is attracted to the positive or negative ion, and so how soluble a particular substance is. So that's using some of the born harbor cycle skills, so the strength of the ionic lattice, and tying it into the calorimetry experiment, such as dissolving something in an enthalpy of solution setting, and maybe talking about polarization and additional covalent character along the way. And the last way that the required practical ties in with thermodynamics is through the entropy topic. Now remember, entropy is almost synonymous with disorder, but certainly it is from the point of view of A-level chemistry. And so the dissolving that I've been talking about all along the way is incredibly an increase in disorder because what we have at the beginning of a dissolving experiment is a very regular ionic lattice in solid format being put in with water, which is I've just drawn as blue circles. And then once the dissolving has happened, that ionic lattice is completely broken apart and everything is a solution. So there is a dramatic increase in entropy during this experiment. And so that could tie in with calorimetry because perhaps you've just worked out the enthalpy of solution of something like magnesium chloride and then you work out the enthalpy of solution of a different particular su substance and it ends up being a positive value. Or maybe they just give you this positive enthalpy of solution and they say, well, how do we know whether or not this substance will actually dissolve? And then that ties in with entropy brilliantly because we can talk about the positive entropy change of the dissolving process. So that's from looking at the equation and inspecting it and saying, well, there's definitely more disorder in the products. But then when we look at the enthalpy of solution, and if that's extremely endothermic, then there is that tie in, that crossover with, well, the enthalpy is saying, no, this won't happen spontaneously, but the entropy is saying that it will happen spontaneously. And so that ties in with the Gibbs free energy calculation. And so you have to do delta G equals delta H minus T delta S to find out if that delta G value is actually greater than zero. Therefore, it wouldn't dissolve spontaneously or less than or equal to zero, in which case it would be a spontaneous change and would just happen. And so very much so there's a logical flow through here where you do a, an enthalpy of solution question and calorimetry tied to that. Then you've got your delta H value from the earlier question that they bring forward and tie it in with some entropy, possibly getting you to calculate that entropy change and then calculating the Gibbs free energy change and commenting on the sign of that value and what that value means. And I'll be releasing an entropy video in the next 24 hours, so keep on the lookout for that, and that will really help crystallise these ideas and help you realise how all these things are interconnected. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.